Um, my name is Vincent Buxkin Rarely, but um, I'm named after my uncle who is much better looking than I, so I don't really use the name because people get us mistaken. <laughs> Everybody knows me as Jack. My Aboriginal name is Ganyapundu Pinakunuwicha. Breaks up in a three small names. I'm going to get you to say it though, alright, because I feel like I'm Destiny's Child today and you're going to say my name, say my name. <laughs> 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 That's a good joke, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> alright, so the first part is Ganya, it's the totemic, it's my totemic name, which means The Rock. My mum reckons I look like Dwayne The Rock Johnson a bit as well. <laughs> right. I'll leave my clothes on because I don't want to intimidate people in the room. <laughs> So first part is Ganya, get you to say Ganya? Ganya. Very good. My newest name is Pundundu Itpina. Alright, start off with the first bit. Pundundu Itpina. Itpina. Now let's say it together. Pundundu Itpina. Pundundu Itpina. Yeah, you can do it. Very good. <laughs> and the last part of it is Kundawicha, number three born in my family and I'm male. So Kundawicha. Alright, now let's do now the real test. Put it all together, alright? Kanya, Pundu Wundu Wipina, Kudna Wicha. As long as I've got it, that's okay, alright? And I'll still get tongue twisted with it, don't worry. It's, a, it's the worst name ever because it just gets so long. But my name keeps changing, it's every born child that we have, our name changed. So I used to be Gulu Wipina first, which is the father of the black swan. Then I was Mukwe Pena, the father of the barking owl. Now I'm Pundu Wundu Pena, the father of the dragonfly. So hopefully my name's going to change again to something a little bit easier. I would like, like to name my, one of my kids like Bat or Spider, because then they could be like Batman or Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. I wish I had that name. Anyway, so, um, and saying that as well, we actually have our favourite child is actually our youngest born, unfortunately, because the name that we have, Pundu Wundu if I don't have any more children, I'm stuck with that name forever. So that's going to be, you're going to get better and better at it, because if we start to find <laughs> my name, then you, you should be upset normally as well. Um, my, I represent three different Aboriginal groups, the Ghana of the Adelaide Plains, the Narunga from the York Peninsula, and the Wirrungal from over near Streaky Basin Junior area as well. My dad's Italian Egyptian Scottish. Um, so I also acknowledge my dad when I do things like this as well because um, he made me who I am today as well. Um, but I'm here to, to welcome you on to country, the protocol for Aboriginal people and I'm going to welcome us here to country through singing a song which acknowledges our spiritual ancestors of the country. So we, we as Aboriginal people believe in three worlds that live harmoniously together. The physical world that we see, but more importantly the spiritual world that lives amongst our country that you Without the, without the right techniques, you, you, you can't really access that world, but it still is, is, is dominant and prominent in this, in this um, society today. And then the sky worlds, which is like the heavens, and, and part of our culture is about acknowledging all of those together. So when I sing the song, it's about acknowledging the spiritual ancestors. I'm going to welcome everybody here, the guest here today, um, through speech, and then acknowledge the ancestors of the country through the song, and also welcome you. And then I'm going to play a bit of didgeridoo, because we like playing didgeridoo. And talking about getting warm, after playing the didgeridoo for a couple of minutes, you get very warm. So if I start taking layers off, join me. No. <laughs> um, so then I'm going to play a bit of didgeridoo, uh, which doesn't come from here, but I enjoy playing. I've been adopted into Arnhem Land, and my father who adopted me is actually the Yediki player as well. And if you don't really understand the importance or the significance of didgeridoo, get down to the South Australian Museum. Um, there's a great exhibit going on at the moment, which really gives you... The, the, the meaning behind the didgeridoo. Um, so, firstly, I just want to explain who I am, where my family come from, and, and then welcome you on to country here, this place we know of as Tandaganya, which is the dreaming place of the big red kangaroo. My family um, grew up on Point Pierce Mission, then moved over to the Riverland, uh, where they lived most of their years, and then came to Adelaide, where I was born, and got to grow up, and eventually became a Ghana language teacher, now teaching it for 10 years or so. Um, so I like giving welcomes because two generations ago my grandfather was, our grandfather we had here as well, uh, was to actually uh, punished for speaking and practicing culture, speaking language and practicing culture. Two generations later I get the opportunity to, to have centre stage and teach people about our language and culture and welcome you onto, onto our country as well. So um, that's probably the, the, the best reason around doing it is obviously to welcome other Aboriginal people to our country as well as protocol, but then as well giving the opportunity to teach and, and other people to learn. So on, in saying that, I'm, I'm going to start the process already. Yes. 
stop talking about yourself, Jack, and just get on. I'm going to repeat to you to kind of follow up in the corner with your back and in a time with the gun and the rank of where I'm from here. I just take a dinner, book a young, cook a fire, yat and yat to happen. Then I think I look at the young, I think I live on a while, I can't yam yam. My wish I'm not to book a young, book a young, come again, me and a year, yaller than a one day man in putting up for yat and yet yat and not trying to gun a sack and eat. Managa look up and dinner, look at a yat and get sick and eat. My wish I'm not to book a young man, man in the putting up. So it's always good that we acknowledge country wherever we go, whether it's between other Aboriginal groups or within different lands within an Aboriginal group. This place is Tandaganya, which is the dream place of the big red kangaroo. But if you go to other areas within a 5 to 10k radius from here, then you're moving into different lands as well. So no matter where we go, we're moving into different lands and traditionally we would be paying respects to those, those people, the land and the ancestors. So now the song that I sing is about calling those ancestors to come and join us and look after us and give us the blessings while we're meeting on their country.
They might be like, oh, he's ready to go. He's ready to go. <laughs> That's going to be a great dance battle up there. Like, so we're going to Anyway, thank you for allowing us. Thanks, Jack, as always. Fantastic. Uh, we'd now like to welcome the Lord Mayor, the right on the Lord Mayor of the City of uh, Adelaide, Martin Casey, to formally open the uh, Cultural Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. And um, Jack, thank you very much for that wonderful welcome to the country. I don't know about you, but the, the didgeridoo just takes me into an entirely different space. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary instrument, an extraordinary sound. So, thank you. I too would like to uh, acknowledge that we meet on Ghana land and that we pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land, both past and present. Of course, I'd like to formally acknowledge Jack Buckskin for performing today's Welcome to Country. Thank you, as always, Jack. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor Megan Hender is with us. Welcome, Megan. Uh, councillors, Councillor Sandy Wilkinson, Councillor Sandy Vershaw, and Councillor Sa uh, Philip Martin. Not oh, Sandy Martin, we didn't have three Sandys. <laughs> Nick Bagakis, AO, Chairman, Adelaide Central Market Authority. And of course, thank you very much to our panel members this morning. Again, our Deputy Lord Mayor, Megan Hender. Leanne Buckskin is with us, Paul Vasilev, and of course, Paul is the Young Australian of the Year. Congratulations again to Paul. I think that's really <laughs> lovely. The wonderful Emma Hack and Bridget Alford. So thank you very, very much to our um, esteemed panel members this morning. I know they'll be providing everyone here with a great deal of value. Sean McNamara, our Associate Director, is with us, and of course our great MC, Kate. Thank you very much, Kate. Now, on behalf of my fellow elected members, uh, very pleased to be here for the City of Adelaide Cultural Summit. The, um, in fact, you are officially now the Culture Club. Right. I've spoken to Boy George and I've got the official designation. You are the culture club. The City of Adelaide Strategic Plan has four strategic themes, which we spend a great deal of time as a City Council, as a group of elected members with our administration. But we're characterised by four very important words when it comes to our planning for the city. That's smart, green, liveable and creative. And that really informs almost everything we do for our city. But what underscores each of those four words is actually culture. So, and culture is really the very essence, I think, of what makes our city, what makes South Australia even, unique. It's how we define ourselves. It's how we define ourselves as a community. So, the dictionary definition, culture, can be broadly defined as manifestations of human intellectual achievement, whether it be ideas, customs, or behaviours. It's how we express who we are as individuals or, of course, as members, as a group. It's our art. It's our public art. It's our performance. It's our live music. It's how we celebrate. It's our food. It's our traditions. It's our sport. Culture can be defined by so many things. But collectively, when you bring it all together, you then look for common threads about what makes the city of Adelaide unique as a culture. And that's what you are going to be exploring today, because culture wears many hats. It is the myriad of moments of recognition, connection and delight that make us proud to be local. I think it's a really important point. It makes us proud to be local. Our culture makes us proud to be from Adelaide. And it also makes visitors feel welcome. Culture can be tangible, culture can be intangible. But when people come to place, they get a strong sense of what the culture is. And again, that's why the work that you're doing this morning is so important, because it's helping us to crystallise that. Adelaide is recognised globally for our cultural life, including as a member of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Now, as you know, I think in December 2015 it was, Felicity, that we were designated as a UNESCO City of Music, and that's something we are very proud of. We're the fifth most livable city in the world, as denoted by the Economist Intelligence Unit, and Lonely Planet lists us as a must-see destination. Now, a lot of that also has to do with our culture. The City of Adelaide plays a very strong part, and has for many, many years. 
in shaping South Australia's cultural identity. We do this through our internationally acclaimed festivals, our sporting events, our cultural institutions, and welcome to Bryant Park, and much more. So as we embrace our culture, it really, and also our multicultural uh, aspects of our community, as we know that uh, South Australia and the city of Adelaide have an incredibly rich multicultural ta tapestry. And so you start putting all these things into the melting pot. Today's summit, is an opportunity to present ideas and discuss how we can work together to support our community's cultural sector, to help grow and flourish the development of the City of Adelaide cultural strategy. So everything starts with a great plan, and that's what you're working on today. The strategy will be developed in partnership with key stakeholders such as yourself, and there's something to meet everybody's needs, and there's something to meet everybody's aspirations. But particularly, today's summit presents the opportunity to discuss two particular questions today. Question one, how can the cultural sector work together to build Adelaide as a multicultural city with a passion to create authentic and internationally renowned experiences? And question two, what role should the City of Adelaide, what role should Council play to help us achieve this? So on behalf of my fellow elected members and our Deputy Lord Mayor Megan Hender, we thank you for coming along today. And uh, the success of this strategy really does rely upon the input, the rich input which we know that you'll be putting forward today and listening to our expert panel group. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful morning. Thank you very much. with the Deputy Lord Mayor, if I may, Megan, just to get us underway, because I know this is an area that you are interested in, in terms of the, the cultural potential of the city. If you had a vision for the, the city of Adelaide, what would that look like? <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, okay, too late. <laughs> um, Look, I, I, I think in some times of the year we actually achieve our vision for the City of Adelaide. Um, and I, I know Sandy Vershaw is here and, and um, I often tell this story. One day when Sandy, Sandy used to be a council member, she's now a council law, uh, sorry, council staff member, she's now a council law. But one day when she was, back in the day when she was a council staff member, she, we walked out, on, out of town hall in the middle of the festival, middle of the fringe, and she said, just have a look at this city, just have a look at it now. And, uh, as a city council, said, we haven't fixed a single road, we haven't picked up any more rubbish bins than we've ever, you know, than, than we did last week. But this week, this month, this is the best place in the world to be. Um, so I think our, our vision is um, to make that intense and, I have to say, at times exquisite experience um, something that can be experienced throughout the year. And I know we're already doing that in relation, particularly in relation to our incredible festivals, you know, Tasting Australia's now taking over the centre of the city, and incredible. But I would also like us to see, to see us doing that with some of the other aspects of our cultural life. Um, and so that we're, we're experiencing the richness and the depth that I think is often already here, but we haven't necessarily uncovered it for ourselves or for our visitors. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you a little bit here, Megan. I'm gonna ask, um, you want us to be the cultural capital of Australia. If we don't have the best infrastructure, in the city, how can we achieve that? If we don't have the best examples, how can we compete with the Sydney Opera House? How can we compete with some of these iconic cultural institutions? Well, first, I think we should argue for some extra iconic cultural institutions where we can. And I know that the, um, Nick from the um, Art Gallery, for example, is doing an incredible job of advocating for a new art um, uh, location. And the symphony uh, ASO is advocating for a concert hall. And I think if we could get those things, that would be great. But I also think it's about acknowledging what we already have and showing what's really precious about them. 
mean, I don't know um, if there's anyone from the museum here. I suspect, for example, there's some parts of our museum that are world class, you know, some parts of our, co our museum collection that's absolutely world class. I don't know that, you know, but I bet it is. Uh, I know that there are bits of our, um, our uh, art gallery, absolutely world class. I don't think bigger is necessarily better. I think it's about that word authentic, you know, what we've actually got to offer. Um, uh, Jack's uh, introduction. I mean, you know, world class. Um, so it's about making sure that we find those things and let other people, let, let, tell each other about them and let other people know about them. So um, while I'd love to build our uh, infrastructure, I don't think that should be a limiting factor for us. I think, um, and in, in fact, in some instances, those limitations provide the creative energy that gets you to a different place in a different way. Okay, and I'm sure you can start making notes with your ideas on some of these topics as we go, because we want to hear about these uh, conversations through the think tanks. Good opportunity to bring Leanne Buckskin in now. Leanne, I'm interested in what your perspective is of Adelaide as a city of Indigenous culture. How much do you think that uh, resonates? Oh, look, I, in comparison to... Um the rest of the country, I think it resonates incredibly highly. It's extraordinary how this city has, well, I think this city cherishes its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts and culture. Um, it has a really, um, really good perspective on what Aboriginality is and what Aboriginal culture is and in that you know, I think if you can walk along the street and ask anybody, you know, what, what, what country is the Adelaide city based on, and they will tell you it's Ghana. There's not a lot of people in other cities that can do that. They could, um, and, and very much distinguish between who's Ghana, who's Nadanjeri, who's Naranga, who are the desert communities, the Pitanjara, Yunkanjara people, where I think that where I know in terms of education, 20 years ago, we were 10 years advanced in terms of the way in which we educate our kids on First Nations cultures. Um, we're advanced in terms of languages, the University of Adelaide, uh, sorry, the University of South Australia. You know, it's Pitanjaro language program's been going for over 30 years. There has been a long-term investment and maybe that's the way in which the city was settled as well. Um, that it wasn't a colonised type of convict, you know, um, dumping ground. Sorry, Sydney, but um, <laughs> in that there was a different approach. And I think the I think history tells us a lot about where we go into the future. Acknowledging history is really important. Um, we did get it wrong in that. Um, I think, unlike other cities as well, where there was Colonel Light, who was, you know, befriended Ghana people, who had Ghana um, people lead him around this city and, and you know, form part of the, the streetscape and the cityscape that we've got today. Like, we know that if we look at the, um, the way in which the city's designed here, that's, you know, you can see the kangaroo, the red kangaroo. You can see the emu in North Adelaide. Um, I think that's extraordinary in the, you know, in the 1800s that, that uh, a man could do that and take that on board. Um, language was, you know, maintained by German missionaries um, at one time until, you know, the colony got going and, you know, God forbid, you know, probably, I'm sorry I'm going to say this, but, um, you know, non-Indigenous women going, no, we've got to get these people off the streets you know, and then people being corralled and then um, put into institutions and then out into missions uh, and then the rest is history. So are we telling the story well enough as Adelaide though? No, I think that we can tell the truth of history and I think that, that as Australia collectively we're yet to do that. We value rec uh, reconciliation so we should. But I think the thing that we've gotten wrong here in Australia is that we don't have truth and reconciliation unlike Canada's model and unlike South Africa's model as well. 
I can, I'm, you know, working with both countries, in particular I'm working in South Africa with First Nations peoples and, um, and working with Mandela's reconciliation faculty at the University of Bloemfontein. And we know the depths of apartheid and that type of thinking um, within that particular country, but if they've got the courage and the bravery to hear truth of history and truth of people's pain, um, it gives capacity for people to be able to join together and support each other to a better future. And that's what I'd like to see happen. So, with your experience internationally, um, are there things that Adelaide can learn? I mean, you talk about telling the truth, not being afraid of the truth as part of the story or the narrative of what Adelaide is. Is there other learnings that you've seen from how cities celebrate or, or even acknowledge First Nations peoples or culture? I think it's still a movement across the world to understand First Nations cultures and peoples. Uh, in January, I was in New York and I was working with the Lenape people who are the traditional owners of Manhattan or Manhattan. And for the, probably for the second time in history did they have a welcome to country. It was so extraordinary, and, and I'll answer your question, but it was so profound because in that room that I was in with the Lenape people and people of New York, of all walks of life, of all ages, who really came out and wanted to know. In this world today, we have people who want a sense of belonging. More than ever, we want a sense of belonging. We want a sense of place. We want a sense of ritual. And when I was in that space for the day in a forum like this, around a big round table, the people who joined that table, New Yorkers who'd been there for 65 years, who were incredibly emotional, who said, for the first time in my life, do I feel like I belong somewhere? Remembering people have migrated all over the world to recreate a sense of place in this world. And I had, you know, um, Puerto Rican a grandmother with her two grandchildren there. Her children were six, her grandchildren were six and ten. Their ability to look at what was happening in that space at that time was so extraordinary the way they articulated their sense of um, respecting heritage. Knowing at that age, and our kids do now, they know that this land was owned and occupied by others. And so they want truth. They want truth first before they are able to connect and to belong to land. Not buildings, but to land. That's what's important. Um, in Australia, we're leading the way internationally. The same thing happened in South Africa with the San the, um, and the, the Khoi community, um, where Welcome to Country <laughs> nearly caused a diplomatic um, thing for me when I first did it, uh, a welcome to country and acknowledged, took three months of negotiations with the university because white Afrikaans still feel that in the free state that they still have a stronghold in that space, right up until the dean got me there the day before and said, Leanne, if we're going to have change in this country, it starts today or tomorrow when you do that. And it did. The turnaround was so extraordinary because what we've got to remember is generations are now demanding more of us. They're demanding more questions why certain decisions were made, why certain people aren't included within spaces and places. And, you know, there I know over there both white African generations and, and black people are trying to build an understanding of what happened in the past so that they can move together more respectfully for the future. And it started with acknowledging First Peoples. I think we can get it better. I mean, if I, for example, you know, Aboriginal people are always perceptive and watching. Body language is a, a big thing in terms of our communication. Um, it's 80% of communication for Indigenous peoples all around the world. 
And I think one thing that disappoints me is that when I see people in a space where, you know, it is customary, it has been customary for thousands of years, that we welcome each other onto countries. There's a whole reason behind that, not just because it's respectful. I don't barge into your front door and say, hello, I'm here. <laughs> um, we wait to be invited, but there's also a safety aspect too. There's cultural reasons for that happening. It's about navigating spaces, where you can and can't go. Um, you know, you don't hold a disco in the local cathedral down the road, for example, that wouldn't be appropriate. So there's all of these sort of, you know, rules and cues and, and that type of thing. Um, but if I see someone rolling their eyes and going, oh God, here we go again. I mean, I think that's such a shame. And, and I think that people um, need to understand that, you know, people of other are surrounded by rituals and cues of Christian faith, of, you know, non-Indigenous people, of English culture constantly bombarded day by day by day. And we have to be... open our minds up a lot more than that to say that if we want to be more diverse, we have to say that our way is not necessarily the right way, that we have many different ways in which we can encompass this. And just another thing, I'll just finish. Mauritia, Mauritius is a really uh, interesting country. I had dinner with a lady in South Africa who's from Mauritius. Now, if you look at the way in which that country was settled, it's got, you know, the Portuguese, it's got the English, it's got a whole heap of, you know, about five different colonised countries and then you've got the Eastern Trade where all of these different melting pots of people came in to this small little country. The wonderful thing about that that blew my mind was Marla said that when it comes to their religious days of celebrations, Every person in that country knows each other's prayers. Everybody comes out and celebrates and participates. They learn it in school. In a, they had a, a way in which was in a harmonious vision for their country. And for that to happen, they all were educated in each other's cultures so they can participate fully, not stand on the sidelines and observe, but to immerse themselves in culture. And I think that's an extraordinary thing. That's great. Well, that's a big idea right there. So, um, and that's what I've actually asked. Um, I've asked the panellists to think about big ideas today. So, perhaps we're going to weave all over the place and I'm going to flick over to Emma. Emma, I, I did ask you beforehand about a big idea for Adelaide. Do you have, do you have a big one or you have a many? Um, I actually found that question to be incredibly difficult to answer, to be honest. Um, so I've written, I'm not sure. Um, for me, though, if I look at all the different sectors of arts, from performance through music um, and visual arts, obviously, that I'm engaged with, I think everyone sort of stays quite secular. Um, and even, um, I guess, the Fringe Festival has really, for me, has pushed out a lot of visual arts in the last couple of years. Um, and I feel that there needs to be some kind of connection between um, all those sectors for us to move forward and to be stronger. Um, and that's why, you know, I guess I do believe like a large contemporary space um, to be built is our ultimate way to move forward. Um, and I do like the idea of what Megan was talking about to think outside the square. But if you look at um, you know, most of the major cities around the world, which I've had been fortunate enough to travel to, they do have a major hub. Um, and, you know, even Melbourne's Fed Square, for instance, is um, a really great example of that. And we're seeing it, I think, now as um, the new arts capital of Australia. Um, and even people in Melbourne are like, oh, I've never got to Adelaide, but they don't see it as a bad thing anymore. They see it as a good thing, right? <laughs> which, you know, it, it's a bad thing for quite some time. Oh, you're from Adelaide, no, it's too bad for you. Um, so now I think, you know, they're inquisitive, but like, how do we draw them here? Um, and I think, you know, not necessarily big is better, but to have that area where, um, you know, contemporary arts and traditional arts um, with what Nick's vision is, is um, there's a really strong Aboriginal um, Indigenous culture 
uh, cultural art exhibition to be part of that. And um, but also, you know, it does need to have a performance space. And what you say about the ASO, I didn't know about that, but I think that would be fantastic. Like, you know, that's ultimate. It's very pie in the sky, it's a big project. Um, but if the right people are behind it, maybe it can happen. Um, and I think that that is that's when you start going. People around the world go, okay, that's a pinpointed moment of going. You know, even Tasmania. Like, I mean. I went to Tasmania as a kid and wandered around, but until I went to Mona, I was like, okay, now I really want to go back there again because I love that space. It's like it's amazing and it's smart and quirky and unusual. So um, yeah, I think that that's something really important that could possibly happen. And giving um, more and more, like with my art prize, like I talk to my artists a lot and I, I've done a survey with them about what they want. And so just to make the story right, so it's the Emma Hack Art Prize. And what, what is that for, Emma? Um, so it's basically all artists in South Australia can enter it. It's run during the Fringe Festival. Um, and there's a theme every, week, every year, um, different judges every year. So uh, the, the finalists change every year, which is great. So even people that have been finalists before sometimes don't get in that year for whatever reason. Um, but what it's done is create a really diverse mix of people. There's 113 finalists now um, over uh, four years and they're all so talented, all different types of um, medium um, from visual, like um, I guess, uh, moving image through to photography, um, painting, mixed media. So, um, and it's a really nice sort of cross-section of what's happening here in South Australia and I guess, um, the talent that we have here, which I think is really important. So when I um, sent out, you know, I did a little survey monkey for them, and um, they're very much concerned, like a lot of them aren't represented, they're all fantastic, you know, and there's a lot of, there's not a lot of places that they can show other than artist run spaces, which are cool and quirky, but they're not heavily commercial gallery spaces in which, you know, I guess, um, tourists and that come into it and say, oh, I really want to buy that piece, like with a great sales person and all that kind of stuff. And I know the commercial side of art is always seen as such a bad thing maybe sometimes, but it's not a bad thing. It's a great thing because then artists can survive as being artists and they don't need to take, you know, a barista job on the side to survive, you know. And I think being able to support visual artists in particular this way, I think, um, would be very beneficial to our city and our cultural state. Okay, so uh, Bridget, I think that's a good place for you to pick up because Bridget, of course, is from the, the Adelaide College of the Arts. And uh, in terms of the intersect between professional artists and emerging artists who are in their education cycle too, how does Adelaide, or how can, I guess, Adelaide offer a platform for artists to, to, to build a professional bridge to, to their career? Mm. I would actually have to say that I think I think we do the bones of it pretty well already um, from my perspective and coming from the perspective of from the education point of view and watching the different ways that our arts programs and I'm talking about acting and dancing um, visual arts of course and the design programs that we run uh, fashion design being one of the main ones are all really um, very strongly linked to industry. So we have um, very strong relationships with State Theatre Company, I think Rod out there. Um, we've got a creative partnership with ADT. Uh, we, we're in dialogue with um, the gallery, Art Gallery of South Australia in CAXA. Um, our, our technical production students who do all the background work in the theatres and, and run these, um, you know, pro these visa pr productions. Um, they, they do a lot of work experience with um, the festival and uh, with WOMAD. Um, so they're, they're on the ground and they're in they're, wherever the opportunity is there. We're interacting with, and the arts educationalists are interacting with people out there in the field. And we've also got a really strong relationship with, with Penny through, through Sala. Um, so I think, I think the basic ingredients are there in terms of those connections there is always more that you can do. And there is always, um, there is always the opportunity to ramp up uh, those interactions and to um, professionalise 
the, the, the type of advice and um, opportunities that are coming into the students. Some of the ways that we look at doing that is to develop different courses that have got a more professional um, outlook. Uh, and there are, we have an arts administration course that's designed to create a professional link. Um, and we're also looking at uh, and developing postgraduate courses in creative entrepreneurship that are specifically directed to creating those pathways. And so is that processes. where the opportunities are, do you think? Is it is about furthering what you're already doing? Or do you have a big idea as well? Yeah, well, I feel when I was asked that question, I mean, our, my big idea and our, from Adelaide College of the Arts perspective is we, we have got... Adelaide, I think, is really well positioned, partly because of its size, partly because of the density of artists across... Um, all of the um, all of the genres that we that we have here, and the support that we get from from government, state, and and local, um, is to become a, a really well honed arts education capital. We've we've already got the interactions, the the partnerships um, that exist between Flinders University and. Union South Australia and, and also Adelaide University are currently being looked at as to how we can bolster them and how we can um, improve uh, the way our programs talk to each other and um, interaction between um, and pathways that, that students can potentially use and grow. So again, there is already a lot of activity in this area. What we don't do is we don't sing about it. We don't, we don't promote it. We don't have a collective um, and, a, and a single voice that's coming out of Adelaide saying, this is actually what we do. And we are doing it really, really well. And look where we can lead. Look where we can lead to. We can lead to WOMAD. We can lead to all of the, the festivals. We can lead to Sala. We can lead to the Art Gallery of South Australia. And we can lead beyond. We can lead internationally with you know, people like Paul Vassilev, who's out there you know, punching the fashion design for us. So I think that's something that we can do a lot better and uh, that is something that is consciously being worked on at the moment. Yeah, it's interesting because I do a lot of work around the country and people have a very strong sense outside of Adelaide that if you were trained as an arts administrator, and there's a lot of them in the room today, that the standard of what the training and the working on these incredibly high level events produces very good people to employ. And I probably, you know, that was always the, the reputation. I don't know how much we really celebrate that, so that's just my opinion. Paul, Paul has an incredible CV. I mean, you should just see what he's up to at the moment. That's <laughs> why he is Young Australian of the Year. Um, he has got this fashion label, Paolo Sebastian, which is just hitting the heights everywhere. It's kind of the runways of the world, international stars are wearing his label. So it's, it's quite a success story. And he has stayed here in Adelaide. And I want to know why and what are the barriers to that, first of all? Because this hooks into the whole retention discussion, I think. Firstly, thank you very much. Um, well, so I, my goal when I started, so I started my label in 2007. I was 17 at CBC. Um, and I love Adelaide, I'm very, I get very homesick, I'm a real homebody. So I was very fortunate to study in Milan in 2009 and it was the first time I had been away from Adelaide for, I had been interstate, you know, for a couple of day trips. So but was that straight out of school? I've got to make this, I've got to no, understand so this No, during, so during high school, I, well, I always knew that I wanted to be a fashion designer, so I started my education very early on, so I was about... 12 years old and I would do one night a week of study uh, outside of school and um, I would do pattern making and sewing lessons and then I also organised my own work experience wherever I could. We did work experience with school but then I also took a week off school here and there to do uh, Lexus George, Rapsamo, a a anyone that would have me I would do work experience with. <laughs> um, so then in... Um, when I was about 14, I said, you know, I want to have a fashion parade because I want to launch this label one day, Paolo Sebastian. And I was given the opportunity to do that in, uh, with one of my subjects called Extension Studies when I was in year 12. And I had an enormous amount of support from um, CBC 
and I was also doing a vet course as well. So every Thursday I would go and encounter it as one of my subjects. So for me, I thought that was the best thing ever because I was doing something that I loved and it was considered as one of my stu subjects at school. So that was fantastic for me and I learned so much just doing that, that one course. And um, so when I finished high school, I had already obviously launched my label. I was still working from home, but I was um, making wedding dresses already and, and had orders for, for dresses. And um, so my dream was to go to TAFE after school. But um, so I started Certificate 3 and unfortunately um, at that time, the TAFE and the, the curriculum, um, I don't know if it's changed now, but it was very different back then, going back you know, t almost 10 years ago. And the industry here was very different. Mm -hmm. So um, the teachers and I had a few creative differences, <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> and so I um, decided to leave TAFE after, um, after Certificate 3 and sort out my own, because I didn't want to stop learning, because learning for me, I, I find you, you, you never stop learning. Um, and even now I'm still always trying to research and learn new techniques and better myself. So um, I sought out a tailor, uh, which was Defabio Brother Tailoring, which is on Pulteney Street. Um, they're unfortunately not there anymore, but they were two brothers that were from Italy and they made Italian suits, traditional method by hand, really beautiful work. Um, so I was very, very lucky that they were willing to take me on as sort of like an apprentice. And so I was there a couple of days a week and learning old school style tailoring. Um, and then towards the end of that year, um, and also Adelaide Fashion Festival had just started that, uh, around that year. So I was a finalist in the Young Emerging Designer program that they had. And um, towards the end of that year, I put my application in to go to Milan and study there. So I was away for all of 2010, uh, sorry, and got back and well, I had the opportunity to stay on. And the second that that was over, I was back on. I didn't even stay for graduation because I couldn't wait to get home. Because mm -hmm. the second I got to Milan, I looked around and I thought, I had just come from our summer back when we had summers, <laughs> like 45 degrees, a week of 45 degrees, and then went to zero degrees in Milan where it was grey and concrete jungle and no trees and just car line streets. And straight away I grew, I, I had always appreciated Adelaide, but I grew a tremendous appreciation for Adelaide within just a sh few short days because I thought we are so, so lucky because um, I remember our teachers at school always mentioning we're one of the only cities to be surrounded by parklands, whereas other cities are city, uh, parks surrounded by city. So that was the first thing that I noticed, and I noticed the people and the culture, everything was so, so different. Um, and although my course was amazing, because all of my teachers were within industry, like my knitwear design teacher was the current knitwear designer for Prada, my illustrating teacher was the illustrator for Gucci. My pattern making teacher was the pattern maker for Dolce & Gabbana. And all these people teaching was a part-time role for them and they were actually within industry. So I learned within the, f the first month so, so much and it really shaped and changed my, my life. Um, so when I came back, uh, when I made the decision to come back, um, because I had the opportunity to, if I wanted to, because I became quite close with a lot of the lecturers and being that they're all in industry, they were happy to organise placements for me within these amazing houses. But it didn't feel right for me and I thought, I don't want to be another person that's gone and left Adelaide because at that time in 2007, 2008, around there, everyone who was in a creative industry, a few exceptions, but many people in creative industries were having to leave to go to Sydney, to Melbourne, to overseas and I didn't want to be an another one of those people um, because I I always hated it because I felt like we always lost so much um, and why couldn't why, why didn't this city deserve to have a creative industry and so I came back and decided to relaunch the label and thankfully I, I have to say I've been very very lucky with um, the local community here the support that I've had to help build the brand I mean when I did my first show I had 
the neighbours, everyone coming to, out to help. Um, because it, it's, it takes a village, it's not just me that's doing this. And even now, I've got a team of 17 people. So it's not just me that, that gets to where we're going. Um, and so when I came back, thankfully that the advertiser, the local media, everyone was really in support of me that whole year that I was away. So I got back and all of a sudden I had all these orders coming in because I just got back from Italy and decided to relaunch the label as with Adelaide Fashion Festival. Um, they gave me my own show and from there it just exploded. I took everything that I learned from Italy and it, um, kind of put it into my new collection and then Sydney started hearing about us and then eventually New York and then the photos went on to Pinterest and it just kind of it exploded from there. I started getting calls from New York and, and all over the place. So, um, and that was 2011, 2012. And so fortunately for me, with my career, I guess um, things have changed here as well. Social media has come into play, uh, which is a huge thing for us because we're now, are now able to connect with the other side of the world. And we now, like even today, I have a client flying in from Singapore who is coming to Adelaide. She's staying four days. She's only coming to Adelaide and then she's flying back out. She's coming here to fit her dress and then pick it up and take it with her. And so we now have scope and reach um, to Asia, the Middle East, to America. And um, a huge amount of our clientele is interstate and, and internationally. And every week we have people flying in, whether it be from overseas or interstate, to come and stay in Adelaide. And I'm really proud to really show off our state, especially during periods of Fringe and Adelaide Fashion Festival and, and Tasting Australia, because I think the city has so much to offer. And I even had a client yesterday who said, um, she was picking up her dress and she said, I'm gonna be really sad to, that, that this is over because I love coming to Adelaide. And, and she's a Sydney girl. And you know, back, back in the day, you'd never hear us someone that, that from Sydney. That is quite extraordinary. <laughs> that is a yeah. massive shift, yeah. I think, in the industry. I think that that is a real lesson. There's a learning in this, the way that Paul is running his business that is, that is quite inspiring. I mean, your perspective, you've seen an international perspective, you've seen how to run your business in a, in a way that could never have been done even, even five years ago, I think. What, do you have a big idea for Adelaide? I think oh, it's a really hard question. I don't know if it's necessarily a big idea. I think it is a small city and I think we need to look at it as an advantage and we have to look at our strengths rather than always our weaknesses as well and build on our strengths. Um, because I think anything that we do, and maybe it takes time, but we do it very, very well. And so I think for me, and um, what I'd like to come out of this is that we work on our strengths and I think we do have a wonderful art gallery, we do have um, a wonderful theatre, we have so much that is wonderful and I think, like you said, it, it, talking about what is good about this state and singing the praises of what we do do well um, can kind of further the industry. I, th I think um, the festivals are great. There's definitely large gaps throughout the year where there isn't that much happening because um, sometimes there have been times where people fly down to see us and they say, so what is there to do? And it's really hard sometimes because, you know, I can offer them to go uh, to, you know, wine tasting or something like that, but if they're not, their cultural doesn't um, permit drinking alcohol, I can't suggest that to them. And um, I, I definitely think places like Rundle Mall um, definitely could do with a bit of work, having seen a lot of shopping malls in my time um, across the world. I, I think we're really lucky with Rundle Mall, the space that we have and the length, it's one of the longest shopping strips, but it definitely needs a lot of work. And I think that, that starts also with the landlords that are there. Um, but certainly we have a lot of opportunities and it's particularly with North Terrace as well. It's, it's an amazing strip and I love um, taking people down there because I think it's just so beautiful and it, it, it's international, but it's all empty. So much of it is empty and it's a real shame because I know when we were looking for our new studio, there was a building on North Terrace next door to Tiffany, which I love. It's one of my favorite buildings in Adelaide, 
but it's condemned. So, and it's such a shame. So um, I think there's a lot of work within the, the, creating that cultural hub um, for, for people to go to. I definitely think the food is wonderful here and, and even, again, clients from Sydney talk about and rave about how good our food and our produce is here in Adelaide and I think that's amazing. Um, and, but I think certainly when there's events on, when there's festivals, that's when the city comes alive and we need more of that. I think that um, there is, I think uh, each of you have said in some form about the strengths of what exists in terms of the content of what's produced culturally. Um, is it that we're not, and I'll throw this open to anyone on the panel, is it that we're not telling the story well enough? Is it about joining the dots? And that is, I guess, the conversation today, why everyone's in the room. How can we leverage the, the, the smallness, I guess, of Adelaide in order to tell a story better? Is there any thoughts on that? Well, I think that we need to ramp up our tourism commission. I don't think that they, and, and, and I don't mean this to be negative at all, but I think that um, tourism can do a lot more to tell the story here. Um, I think it tells the easy story of, you know, there's Kangaroo Island and there's this, that and the other, the general gist, the wineries and all of that, but I think that they've got to delve deeper into our culture and draw more out. And I think that, um, you know, uh, in terms of Indigenous culture, there's a wonderful uh, walk that you can do along the Torrens River. People, most people know it, and I hope most of you in the room have done it. Excuse me. <coughs> but, um, you know, why aren't they included in hotel rooms and things like that? Why aren't people's attention being drawn to those type of things? Why do we need to wait for festivals to occur for that information to go to visitors to this state? And I think that from being in, in a festival background, I mean, most people in this room I know, Christy and, and Kate, and we've, you know, we've come through the festival model where, you know, I was trained by the Adelaide Fringes as, as an event coordinator and arts administrator. And what I see in terms of tourism is that um, even festivals aren't promoted well through tourism. So I think we need to get away from the safety and delve deeper and be more intellectual and, um, and, and draw out more of our cultural diversity and getting them into the hands of people who are visiting here, whether that's through our airports and our hotels. <coughs> I agree with the tourism um, comment as well. Like it is very uh, driven towards food and wine, which is great, and you know, KR is fabulous, um, but it doesn't really hit on what's happening culturally. They did, you know, there was one ad with the NXA song behind it. Um, and yeah, it just for me, it didn't really explain anything. And I have to go back to my original comment, which was connecting. And um, even like a program that's almost like a choose your own adventure or something like that, where you can connect the dots, where they actually do wander throughout a few different institutions rather than just going, oh, I'm going to the art gallery or I'll go to the museum today, you know, like give them a reason and get the facilities sort of working together to create like programs that are interesting for people that travel. Um, and, you know, they may have one or two days to get through it, but they can choose sort of areas and whether it's an app or something like that where, because they now move to this room or move, move here and take you on a bit of a journey, um, those kind of things are fun. And especially if you're wanting like a younger market coming and checking out what we've got going on here as well. Um, they love apps and they love something interactive and, you know, you can give the information without having the manpower having to do it, if, you know, obviously that can be like a funding issue. Um, so, yeah, I sort of really feel that tourism needs to do something and I think also, like, um, if the City of Adelaide is looking at doing, you know, pinpointing where are, like, the major places where you can go and, you know, see places and what you can do there, what's on current and is there anything that's, like, a website that has everything like that that's continuously being updated here, you know? Like, if I go to another country, the first thing I do is try and find a website or something that says what's on, what's culturally on in this country, this capital, this city, wherever I am, you know? And, you know, I've been to the big art fairs like your Basels and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, when you're there for Basel, they give you a program of what's on during that time. You know, why can't we have an arts week in a dead month like, um, I don't know, there's any major happening in November or something, 
You know, wouldn't it be great to invite major gallerists from all around the world to come here so that artists from all over Australia can come here and actually meet them, have forums in which they can meet those people, uh, whether it be like a quick introduction kind of speed dating thing. But they, the problem is with artists, it's very hard to get your work seen. So finding a way in which you can facilitate, but think bigger than just, just trying to get Adelaide artists' work, what about the whole Australia? Like, you know, why don't we become the forefront of something like that? You know, so that doesn't really heavily exist. So you've got Sydney Contemporary, which is pretty cool, but they don't connect. It's all very... So, you know, they don't connect, you know, your artists as you go around. I've just recently been in Melbourne at the Documentary Filmmaking Conference, which I sort of randomly went to. I'm obviously not a documentary filmmaker, but that's something I want to do. So I just rocked up there and had the opportunity of meeting, you know, people from National Geographic magazine and Discovery and all the people that I wanted to pitch to, you know, it's like a dream. So, you know, um, things like that, you know, that, that could happen here and that could happen for artists here. And artists from around the country could come here to have those experiences, wouldn't that be cool? So, yeah, same with dance and everything, like the full works. Thanks, Thanks. Emma. I, I, interested, Megan, you have had an experience, because I don't want to, because tourism aren't on a pa the panel here, so it's not fair for them not to be able to um, talk about what strategies they might have in place. But Megan, you did mention to me that there was some change in some of the direction with regard to the placement of Adelaide within the strategy of what the South Australian tourism... Yeah, uh, in their, in their defence, they're not here. They, the tourism numbers are up really significantly um, in South Australia in the last 12 months, I think up 14 or 18 per cent or something. So they're, in some respects, they're doing a very good job at drawing people here. But I totally agree with what you're saying about making the experience when, when they get here rich. And, you know, I, I, I said to um, Kate the other day, you know, if we could get every person who visited Adelaide to stay just one more night, think of the economic benefits that would bring. And that's about enriching the experience and making sure there's plenty for them to do while they're here. And I've forgotten your question, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there, uh, so you're aware that there has been a change, and I know ah, Sandy yeah. as well yeah. has... So um, the, the Tourism Commission does promote yeah. Adelaide now as a destination. When uh, you know a few years ago, if you went on the Tourism Commission's website, it told you about the Barossa Valley, McLaren Vale, um, everywhere else, but actually didn't say anything about Adelaide. Yeah. Now there's a drop-down box for Adelaide, which is a great, uh, a great start. But I, 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 to, to your point earlier about is it about us not telling our story well enough, I think absolutely it is. It, that is part of our issue, and I think it's one of the things we really absolutely have to address. I mean, just hearing. Leanne talking about um, how well we do by comparison nationally and internationally with Indigenous uh, issues. You know, that I didn't know that. And that's, I have to say, incredibly heartening. And it's something we ought to be really proud of. And I'd, I'd love for those stories to be, um, to be better told. One of, the, um, one of the opportunities, I think, for, that, for this is through... Um, and this is, I know, only one segment of culture, but through our UNESCO City of Music designation, um, so, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, UNESCO have um, a program of creative cities and I think there are about 140 cities only in the world who have got a creative city designation and you can get that designation in a number of categories. Music is one of them and we are a music city of music but literature, design, media arts, craft, you know, all sorts of different categories. And last year I um, attended, I was lucky enough to attend the Creative Cities Conference in Beijing where they invited all of the cities who, with this designation. Some of the cities, um, it is their raison d'etre. You know, if you, if you go to, for example, Dunedin in, um, in New Zealand, small city, you know, it's a city of literature. You wouldn't get out of that city without knowing it was a city of literature. Here, we are a city of music. I reckon you could easily get through Adelaide and out the door back into the airport without ever really noticing that. Um, and, and yet, uh, I have heard some of the best live music I've heard anywhere in the world. My husband's a jazz fan. He's dragged me into jazz clubs all over the world. But, you know, I've heard better music or as good a music uh, in Adelaide as I've heard anywhere where I know that, for example, the guitarist who's on the stage in front of us, when he's not playing in Adelaide, he's playing in New York and he's got 14 people in the audience and I know that the Hilton's full of people who are here on holidays and they've got no idea that just around the corner in La Boheme the new cabal is playing every Wednesday night and they are sensationally good. You know, so part of what we have to do is, is tell those stories about what we are actually doing really, really well and showcasing our own um, existing talent, but also packaging it up, mm. I guess, packaging it up in a way that makes it um, 
palatable or bite offable or, or somethingable so that people actually gra grasp at the opportunity. So, Megan, what's the role that council plays in all of that? I, th I actually think that is partly our role, um, is to make sure that people get to know what's on while we're here. Um, and that's why we're having this, I suppose, um, forum, because we want to know more about how we can do that well. I think, I think our job is to make sure that we deepen and enrich the experience people have once they get here. I think the state's job is to get them here. Our job is to make sure that once they get here, they have a deep and rich experience. And, um, and I think it's not just about, you know, I mean, live music is one of the things that I care about. But it's also about, um, you know, it's about the other aspects of culture. Um, you know, it's about the, the incredible river walk, which um, I've had the opportunity to do and, you know, blown away by. Everybody should get that opportunity. But it's also, you know, climbing Mount Lofty. You know, everyone goes to um, Sydney and thinks I've got to climb the Sydney Harbour um, Bridge. Well, you know, maybe, maybe our experience of climbing Mount Lofty, which is, you know, if you've done it, it's actually pretty bloody gorgeous. Um, uh, you know, why isn't that something, you know, so it's about those other aspects of, of our cultural life that we package up in a way that makes them um, uh, uh, easy to access. And, and the other thing is I love the DRWEA uh, guide and I go through it, you know, it's my bedtime reading and... <laughs> Sad, I know. <laughs> Junk mail too. It's the only time I get to shop. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in there, I mean, Morialta Falls has got rock art, Indigenous rock art. I mean, who knew? Why do I have to read it in the WEO course guide? <laughs> you know, the Pamarank people have got beautiful rock art that's on a private property. And... Well, I won't get into the politics of that, but you know that, um, well, why haven't we got access to that? This is, we live in a country that has the oldest art gallery in the world. Um, you know, we always look towards WA and the Burrup Peninsula and, you know, there's mining and all of that sort of stuff going on. 75,000 years of cultural knowledge lives in this country and that is the foundation of, that is all of our heritage. We all share in that. And so why don't we know that 20 minutes out of the city we can go up to Morialta Falls, look at Rock Heart, climb up and go up Mount Lofty and come back down again? I mean, you could even go out to Pemerant country and see that. So, you know, the other thing about Adelaide that I really love is our placement. We are on the edge of a desert. We're on the edge of ancient landscapes within a two and a half hour drive of this place, which is so extraordinary. When we're talking about going into a city, the first thing I do is jump on a tourist bus. My time's limited. I want to get a geographical, you know, get my geographics. So I jump on a two and a half hour bus tour. But when I stick those plugs in my ears, I want a depth of knowledge, of culture, you know, New York actually does it really well because they've got local New Yorkers who have retired and they jump on the bus and it's awesome. I mean, you, I, I learnt things about New York that... I mean, they've got signs. If you've got a dot of one or you've got a dot of two or dot of three, it means that, one, you're doing really, really well and your restaurant's well populated. To two, well, you might have had a cockroach run across the floor and you've got two. Three, don't even bother going in. You probably end up being carted out. But, you know, that's the sort of stuff that I love to hear about. And you get that in places like Rome. And, you know, heritage is more than just about people and ritual. It is about food. The Italians love their food. I mean, they, they have recipes in Rome that are hundreds and hundreds of years old and you are not allowed to touch that recipe at all. I mean, isn't that extraordinary? Why can't we do things like that here, you know, to those depths of, of our produce and, and, and what we do? The food is, is exquisite here, mm. absolutely. Um, but anyway, you know. No, it's great, it's great. I was just going to say, I think, as you mentioned before, the app would be a great idea <laughs> or some form of brochure or guide, you know, even... I've got a small one that we've um, created for our clients, but it's certainly not what it could be, 
Um, and I think it, it would be wonderful to have all these different, th even I'm learning about things that I didn't know that were here. Um, so I think that is really, and that's, it's not necessarily a really big thing to come out of this. It's quite a simple thing, I think, with uh, what the Tourism Commission and what the council and everyone here would have access to. And if you put it into an app and you, if you have a talking guide or something like that that you can just read through, people, they come here, especially people from overseas, forget the you know, interstaters as well, but people from overseas, they're coming to Australia because they love our culture. It's so different and um, diverse to what they're used to. The Italians love coming here because it's culture shock for them. So um, having something, I think, like an app or like a more of a brochure and pushed through the hotels um, that can tell the story and, and, and really amplify our culture and history because that's important as well because our history is very different to their history and it is so rich and um, I, I think they see us as a, a country that's only 200 years old. And the, that's the perception of a lot of people. It's only 200 years old, but it's obviously not. So I, I think it's telling the whole story and shedding light on the whole culture that's here. Yeah. I'm trying to say that I just think the cultural side is actually a ma major draw, a draw card um, our Indigenous culture, as you are just talking about. You know, um, in the past people have been like very interested in going to, you know, Alice Springs or whatever. You know, if, if they're being holiday as they're coming over, you know, they'll go, there's that hub where I can get all the information about, you know, our Indigenous culture when, you know, you travel all around Australia and it's completely different because it's all different regions and areas and the way they do things and everything. So why don't we nurture all those little lovely, you know, intricate parts and stories, you know, and we could start actually um, here in the city of Adelaide just listening to you talking. Wouldn't it be great just to have, you know, a little sign saying, here, this happened, or here, this happened, and, or this is, you know, a song that you can listen to um, via the app that we're building, of course. Um, you know, like, you know, that, that is very interactive space, so you can travel and you can learn more about the Indigenous culture, because I honestly think that that's what people want to connect with when they go to other countries. They want to learn more about what was here first, and because that's so unusual, mm. isn't it? And we have the oldest threads. Yeah. yeah. So, absolutely. isn't that amazing? Mm. Why don't we share that more? Or find ways that we can now you know, people like myself can connect with other people um, from the Aboriginal, you know, community and create things together. So that is a togetherness rather than just Tandanian doing Tandanian stuff or just, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I know the Art Gallery really are pushing, you know, even the Ramsey Prize, we see a lot of um, Indigenous finalists in there as well, and I think it's great. Um, so there is a push, but it's finding a way that, you know, there's a lot more interaction would be really great. And there is, I mean, Jack, who you met this morning, um, we were talking last week in a meeting and he said, Leanne, I've got this great idea. I need $100,000. And I said, oh, holy dolly, okay. <laughs> um, um, and he said, it's virtual song lines. He said, we've got a VR project through the Language Centre that we want to create that maps the whole city. That people can either, I mean, he wants to go VR uh, and... Um, he's ready, they're developing it now, but he wants to give all visitors, all South Australians, an appreciation and depth of stories by walking the streets of here and telling those stories way before there were buildings here. And I think that would be the most extraordinary thing. Um, you know, here are the next generations coming up, seeing a vision for their cities and a connection, and that's the stuff that we should be supporting. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, I think we will actually throw open to some questions now. We've probably got about 10 minutes, but I know that there's a lot of knowledge in the room too, and I can see. Okay, all your points, are, hands are going up everywhere. How exciting. So you can bring up those points as we go into the think tank. So I'd just like to finish. Is there anything that you want to add, panellists? You get the last word on this. <laughs> Just one thing that I thought of briefly, and it may or may not help, but um, I recently went to uh, the Business SA Awards, and that night they awarded so many different people doing, uh, South Australian businesses doing amazing things. I was sitting next to um, Almond Co. They're the largest exporters of almonds in the world, 
and they're in Adelaide. Um, the people that did the special effects for Pirates of the Caribbean, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings from Adelaide. The people that do the Olympic torch, the flame, Adelaide. And I didn't, I found all of this out that night. And I think um, while this might not be about promoting Adelaide businesses necessarily, but I think that there's something there in that people in, within Adelaide don't know that there's all these amazing things going on. A lot of people in Adelaide don't know that we're in Adelaide. They think that we're in Italy. So, um, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, I, I think there's something about also promoting what's local, um, whether it be local shops or cafes, farmers, industries, whatever it is. And then when there are these events that are on, the festivals, whatever, if they can use the people that do the flames for the, the Olympics or whatever it is, or the people that do the special effects, I think it's utilising the local businesses here as well again to oh, it's connecting I think that's, that's right. the, the overall message really that's great Paul I mean I think the strength of a brand is the sum of its parts and so I think for Adelaide that's probably something you should be picking up when you're having a conversation it's been raised here a lot of times I'd like to thank our panel thank you very much very good to speak. <laughs> Another local icon, of course. So that's nice. Hope I get one. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I would now like to also introduce the independent facilitators for the think tanks. That's the think tanks. So this afternoon, tomorrow, which is going to follow. If I could just have the Leanne Murphitt from Strategic Matters, just wave. Thank you, Leanne. In, in orange, in association with Mark Searle, hand up. Mark Searle and Associates. And they're going to be running the, the sessions. Now, there will be photographs taken throughout the sessions. If you don't want to be photographed, because I can imagine you wouldn't want to be photographed in an environment like this, you please just, you know, let Mark or Leanne know. I'm only kidding. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you to everybody who's joined today. And I would also now like to introduce uh, Sean McNamara, who's the Associate Director of Community and Culture for the City of Adelaide for City of Words. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Certainly in the engagement we've done so far, um, there's been, that's been really enlightening in that regard. So we've received really strong messages about culture having the potential to amplify uh, the value of everything we do. And also the council's got a, a role to create an environment where the sector can really flourish. Uh, today was really enlightening. Um, uh, so many good points, but perhaps three that I, um, that I really took out of it. Uh, our history is, is quite unique and maintaining an authenticity to that history uh, is really important. Um, uh, Leanne's point around Mauritius really hit home for me as well and the, the fact that we should strive for the community to immerse itself in all cultures rather than just observe them, I think that's, uh, that's really important. Uh, and focus on education around culture and arts and, and optimising our strengths, building on our strengths were probably the three main points uh, I took out of several excellent points. So, Today's been really valuable for me and uh, for my team, and I'd like to thank all of you for participating uh, in the day. Um, I think Jack has left, but Jack's uh, Welcome to Country was typically entertaining, but, um, but also really important. Um, when I listened to him talking about his grandfather being prevented from speaking his language and, and practicing his culture only two generations ago, I, I don't know whether to feel deep shame about that or actually take a glass half full approach and think isn't it fantastic that we're actually taking a journey away from something that's scarcely imaginable but, um, but it was great for Jack to, to share that with us. Um, I would really like to thank the panel members as well, what a fantastic uh, panel we had so if we could just express our uh, gratitude. <laughs> Finally, I'd just like to thank my family.
fantastic team for putting today uh, together. So um, Anne, Sarah, Pip, Felicity and Ed, and quite unbelievably in a team of eight, they have three Danielle 